Okay, so good morning once again. And for today, uh, we will actually be studying um, the nature of antigen and the major histocompatibility complex. Okay, so just to give you an introduction. So the term antigen, okay, the term antigen is actually a concoction of two words. So anti here refers to antibodies. And gen refers to generator. So meaning to say, an antigen is actually the antibody generator. So which means that if if an anti if a certain antigen is actually uh, can actually stimulate our immune system to produce antibodies. Okay. So there is actually another similar term to antigen. And that is immunogen. Uh, so when you say immunogen, so it is actually a type of antigen that can elicit an immune response. So if if a certain um, immunogen can elicit, if a certain antigen can elicit an immune response, then that's what you call an immunogen. Okay, and of course. Um, each individual, for example, I would react differently to a certain antigen. You would react differently to a certain antigen. And one of the reasons for that is because of the so-called genetic predisposition. Okay, that particular genetic predisposition is actually being dictated by the major histocompatibility complex. And that's the one um, that we will be discussing for today. Okay, so the major histocompatibility complex. So that's the reason why um, for today's meeting, uh, we will be discussing the factors influencing the immune response. Uh, what are the traits or characteristics of immunogen? And then we will also be discussing and defining um, the terms epitopes, haptens, adjuvants, and then um, the relationships of antigen to the host the major histocompatibility complex and its role in the immune response. So the last bullet is actually um, one of the most difficult and complex topics here in immunology. Okay, so let's talk about immunogenicity. Okay, so immunogenicity depends on several factors. Okay, we will be discussing them in detail later on. Um, the foreignness, chemical complexity, the molecular size, the dose of the antigen, and then the route of immunizations, and of course, the presence of adjuvants. So at this point, let us discuss what are the different factors that may influence the immune response. Okay, number one factor is age. What does it mean? Um, as we grow older, um, there is already a decreased response to antigenic stimulation, okay? So, which means that old individuals may have weak immune system. So, they may be considered as uh, technically immunocompromised as compared, as compared to um, individuals at your age. So, meaning to say, meaning to say, um, uh, if you remember no, the priority of immunization, uh, we have A1, these are the healthcare workers. And then A2, these are the senior citizen. So if you notice, they are actually being uh, being placed second to the healthcare workers because they are considered to be as vulnerable population when it comes to when it comes to the stability of the immune system and also the neonates. Okay. Um, the reason why neonates are considered to be as vulnerable because they are not yet fully developed. In fact, a neonate or a newly born individuals cannot produce its own antibodies. And majority of the antibodies being produced by the neonates are IgG. And IgG are the maternal antibodies. So IgG are the maternal antibodies. So the neonates cannot produce its own uh, immune system. 
and of course, very important that the overall health status. I mean, your the nutrition. Okay, so if you are fully nourished individual, then your immune system would be more stable, and then you can withstand um, the threat of infections and even malignancy. Okay, fatigue and stress. Um, there are many studies that fatigue and stress can actually weaken okay, our immune system. So that's the reason why um, it's very important that we beef up our immune system so that we do not, and then we do not want to have any um, negative lifestyle. We do not want to um, to be too much exhausted. Okay, you should have enough sleep. So these are the things um, that we should be doing, particularly nowadays amidst the pandemic. Uh, excuse me for a while, just. Okay, thank you. So again, the route of in inoculation um, refers to how vaccines are administered. Now, to give you to give you an introduction, though we will not be discussing vaccines yet, but vaccines are actually a type of antigen. So, but it is not just an antigen because these vaccines are actually um, attenuated. So when you say attenuated, they are weakened. They are weakened, okay? Or sometimes um, they are made up of killed organisms. Or sometimes they are subunit vaccines. So there are several types of vaccines, and we will be discussing that on Chapter 25. But I just want to give emphasis on the fact that the route of inoculation, okay, could actually affect um, the immune response or can actually influence the immune response. As you can see here, um, there are several routes of administration, okay? So we can administer it intravenously, intradermally, subcutaneously, or even orally, okay? So the immune response will be different depending on the route of immunization. So the most common route, okay, for those of you who receive a job for COVID-19, so probably you have received the subcutaneous or intramuscular route, okay? So subcutaneous or intramuscular route would have a good response, particularly in draining the nodes. The nodes here refer, uh, refers to the lymph nodes. Uh, in the previous chapter, we have discussed that lymph nodes are considered to be as the secondary um, lymphoid organs, okay? And there are lymphocytes in the lymph nodes, and they are the ones who would encounter the antigen. So if you administer it subcutaneously or intramuscularly, so that's a very good technique. Okay. If the vaccines are being, or if the antigen is being administered intravenously, there would be 
a general or systematic res systemic response, particularly through the spleen. Okay, uh, though intravenous intravenous inoculation is not really that common because uh, again, it's actually much difficult and subcutaneous or intramuscular would have a proper response. So particularly during mass immunization, um, it would be better to do subcutaneous or intramuscular. Okay. So the other one would be by intranasal. Okay, intranasal. So, or, or in when you say intranasal, um, usually it is being given through the nasal mist. And it is already available, um, particularly for influenza, for influenza A vaccine. Okay, so it's been given in the form of nasal mist. Um, they say that for COVID-19, even if you are if even if you are fully vaccinated or uh, per, per, particularly myself i've already been immunized fully vaccinated and and even received a booster dose last december and and i got infected still last january 12. so how is that even possible it's because the pathogen covid19 will enter through your um through your nasal cavity or through your mucous membrane. If you are fully vaccinated, you have enough antibodies in your circulation, but not through your mucous membrane. I'm not protected in the mucous membrane. I'm only protected um, uh, inside, but not through the guards, which which are the which the mucous membrane. So they say that um, in order for us to totally stop COVID-19, we should develop a nasal mist spray. If we have a nasal mist spray, it will protect our mucous membrane because it will actually allow IgA, particularly the secretory IgA. So the secretory IgA, the secretory IgA will somehow guard our mucous membrane so that you'll have a very good mucosal response. Okay, so there's another one, intestinal. So in order for us to have a good intestinal mucosal response, then this particular vaccine should be given orally. Because in our intestines, we have the so-called mouth, the mucus-associated uh, lymphoid tissue. An example of that is the payer's patches, the, the payer pa patches. So there are some vaccines that can be given orally. So a good example of that is the Savin vaccine. So the Savin vaccine is being given orally and it is an example of the trivalent polio vaccine. Okay, so I think you have already received it uh, when you were uh, when you were born, so you were being given a trivalent vaccine. So it's being given orally because there are two types of, of polio vaccine. The other one is SALK. SALK vaccine is being given intramuscularly while the saving vaccine is being given orally. Okay, so there. So these are the different route of immunization and the route of immunization um, indeed would affect you know, immunogenicity. Okay, so adjuvants can make immunization more effective. That is true. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, adjuvants are being added. So these are being added together with vaccines. Being added together with vaccines, it will make the immunization more effective. And it actually works by targeting the antigen presenting cells. Okay, so again, um, I hope it's not your first time to, to hear about antigen presenting cells. Um, antigen presenting cells are mostly macrophages, dendritic cells. Okay. So these are examples of antigen-presenting cells. So 
antigen presenting cells will present uh will present the cells uh, i mean the antigen presenting cells will display will display the antigenic structure the fragments of the antigen using the mhc plus 2 so we will be discussing this in details later on okay so adjuvants will make the vaccines more effective so it will also protect the immunogens from degradation so that uh, it will be processed by the antigen presenting cells and it will allow longer response time that attracts more immune cells to the injection site okay so this is one of the reasons why um, the side effects of immunization is pain at the injection site because aside from the fact that the needles the needle is sharp um, there is a prolonged inflammation sometimes and that's a good sign because more immune cells are attracted to the site of the inoculation okay so adjuvants are needed so that it will accelerate immune response and increase duration of protective immunity so we will have a separate discussion on adjuvants um, during chapter 35 discussion okay so that's for the adjuvants so aside from the age the nutritional status and then we have the route of immunization and our fourth factor is adjuvants okay we also have the dose this is our fifth factor so the larger the amount of immunogen is exposed to the greater the immune response okay so very large doses can induce tolerance so wag naman sobra okay so we do not want um overdosing because if there's an overdosing then there is an immunologic tolerance so instead of antigen uh, might be converted to tolerogen so later on i will be defining tolerogen to you okay so the larger the amount of immune gen exposed to the greater the immune response okay so that's the reason why um some some um immunization uh would require you to have the first dose the second dose and even the booster dose what is the reason for that the reason for this is there is a repeated exposure okay so if there is a repeated exposure then there would be a very good immune response okay so if you receive first dose then you should strive to get the second dose and even the booster dose so in general the higher the dose of antigen the greater the immune response so this is what i've been telling you repeated exposure to an antigen lead to the large number of immunocompetent cells okay so what do we mean by immunocompetent cells so when we say immunocompetent cells these cells are actually capable of mounting an immune response for example plasma cells plasma cells would become immunocompetent if plasma cells are capable of secreting antibodies okay so that's what we meant by immunocompetent cells so these activations allows a faster response each time the antigen is encountered not just a faster response but a response with that can result to high antibody titer when we say high antibody titer when we say high antibody titer we are referring to um, antibody with increased concentration okay now among the things that i've been telling you here the most important thing about the repeated exposure is this one okay an amnestic 
or secondary response. Okay, so what is an amnestic or secondary response? Our the cells of our immune system would have the capability to remember previous encounter. Okay, they have the capability to remember previous encounter with an antigen. Okay, because of the fact that we have memory cells. Okay, so the presence of memory cells will allow us, would allow the cells of our immune system to remember encounter with previous antigen. And since they have already they have already been trained, they have already been trained to remember previous antigen. Then if they see the same antigen again, if they see the same antigen again, then they are now much prepared. And that's the very essence of immunization. The very essence of immunization or vaccination is to train our body. Okay? So for example, um, the reason why we are giving COVID-19 vaccine is what we are giving is actually a weak antigen or what we are giving is a fragment of that virus so that it will train our body to produce antibodies. And it will even train, and then if you have the second dose, it will even train your memory cells okay, to remember this particular virus. So that when the actual virus enters your body, when the real virus enters your body, your immune system is more trained. And more or less, you will win the battle. Okay? So majority of people who died from COVID-19, majority of them are not immunized because they are not properly trained. But immunization will not really totally and absolutely prevent you from getting an infection. Look what happened to me. I even get a booster response, but but I only got I'm only sick for five days. And after five days, I tested myself in antigen test, then I'm negative. So there. Actually we have uh, we have one box of I bought this in Lazada. So we have one box of antigen kit and we're doing it DIY so that's the reason why um I'm, I'm actually uh I'm licensed to do it since I'm RMT so so yeah so I tested myself you know I, I when when the the first time I got positive because I have this running nose and then I tested myself uh, I'm positive and then just like having an ordinary common colds I, I did not develop pneumonia, although I have difficulty in speaking because of the sore throat. And then after five days, the more the first morning that I woke up that I didn't have any sore throat at all, I tested myself again, and then I'm negative. See? So that's the beauty of having a booster dose. So, you know, um, you have, your immune system is already trained to defeat pathogens such as COVID-19. So for those of you who are not yet vaccinated, for those of you, for those of you who didn't even have the booster dose yet, I'm encouraging you to get one. Okay. So the second aside, uh, aside from that, uh, we also have the size. Immunogenicity depends on macromolecular size remember macro means that it is large antigen is should really be large how large should be at least 10,000 tampons in order to be recognized by the immune system and the most active ones are at least 100,000 tampons so remember this if the antigen is below 10,000 Daltons, we do not call it an antigen, but we simply call it a half pen, and half pen needs a carrier. So half pen would need, uh, half pen would need carrier. Okay, so how, how you, therefore, this one is number six, am I right, number six? 
chemical complexity. Okay? So a complex molecule is more immunogenic than... Let me go back. Uh, this one is not six. Six is about the size. And then this one is number seven, the chemical complexity. Okay? So it's not just about the size, it's also about complexity. So a more complex molecule is more immunogenic than a simple one. So what will make it more complex? Good immunogens are proteins with at least more than 20 amino acids in it. Then a good immunogen would also be a combination of different chemical compounds. For example, lipoprotein. Lipoprotein is a combination of lipids and proteins. And an example of a good lipoprotein, a good immunogen as lipoproteins, um, this is an endotoxin. So if you remember, endotoxin is found in gram-negative cell wall. Then another good immunogen is glycoproteins. So glycoproteins are combinations of carbohydrates and proteins. So it is a combination of carbohydrates and proteins. So carbohydrates and proteins are, are the ones that can be found in our blood group. Okay. So the one that can be found in our blood group, for example, um, the carbohydrates are the sugar in type A blood is called N-acetylglucosamine. If you are type A, the sugar is called N-acetylglucosamine. Okay, so that is for the type A blood. Okay, so for the type B blood, okay, for the type B, uh, let me search for it. Type B blood um, would have the B galactose. Okay, so these are glycoproteins. Okay, so combination of carbohydrates and proteins, and they will make up a very good immunogen. And then the nucleic acid. Nucleic acid alone is a poor antigen. So it has to be combined with other proteins to become a good immunogen. Okay, so written here are examples of weak immunogens. So for example, um, the small polypeptides insulin is an example of a very weak immunogen. Pure lipids or pure carbohydrates are not good immunogen. And John. Okay. Also, also, um, antigen can be of two types. Uh, we will be discussing this later on, though it was already mentioned here. So we have P dependent antigen. And the other one is the T independent antigen. So what's the difference? So when you say an antigen that can trigger immune response without the help of T helper cell, it's called T independent antigen. But if a certain antigen um, would need the help of T helper cell, so that antigen is considered to be as T dependent antigen. So kung kailangan ng help, dependent. If hindi kailangan ng help ni T helper cell, so that's what you call the T independent antigen. Okay. Uh, size. Uh, okay, let's go back to size. Molecular size. I think um, I have already uh, discussed this one, but let me repeat it. Why size matter? So, larger molecule is more immuno immunogenic than a small one. Immunogenic molecules are usually greater in size, more than 10,000 Dalton. Size correlates with complexity. First, 
um, glycoproteins are more complex, has a larger molecular size as compared to pure carbohydrates or to pure proteins. And the bigger the size, the more antigenic determinants are present. And these antigenic determinants are defined as epitopes. Okay, so when we say epitopes, we are referring to the site, the site of antigenic determinant. So simple repetitive molecules like sugars or pure immunogens. And another thing, why size matter? The larger the molecules, then they are much easily phagocytized. And molecules must be degradable by macrophages for presentation because macrophages is an example of ATC. Later on, when we go to major histocompatibility complex, um, I will be discussing how this particular phenomenon happened. Okay, so antigen presentation by macrophages. So a while ago, I was telling you about an epitope. So what is an epitope? So an epitope is defined as the site of antigenic determinant. Okay, so take a look at the figure um, herein. So this is an example of the bacterial cell. Okay, take note, the entire bacterial cell is the antigen itself. Okay, so take note of the antibodies. Then we also have another antibodies here. So if you would be, if you will be looking at the illustration, the antibodies will not just bind anywhere else in the antigen. The antibodies will bind specifically at a particular site in the antigen. And that particular site is called epitope. And a single antigen would have different antigenic sites, but a particular antibody would only bind to its a specific epitope. Okay, so for example, antibody B would only bind to this kind of epitope and antibody A will just bind to this kind of epitope. And that's the reason why epitopes are called antigenic determinants. Okay, the entire bacterial cell is an antigen, but not all would be capable of receiving or not all would be capable of being a receptor site for the antibodies to bind. So a particular or specific site wherein the antibody would bind is called an epitope. Okay, I hope that's clear. So according to according to the previous um, discussion, okay, the more complex the more complex the antigen is, then there would be more antigenic determinants or epitopes. Okay, so let's talk about an epitope. Epitope is the key portion of the immunogen recognized in the immune response. Okay, so it's the key portion of the immunogen recognized in the immune response. And there are several examples of epitopes. So some of them could be a linear epitope. So as you can see, uh, amino acids following one another on a single chain. So this is an example of a linear epitope. Okay, and then we also have the conformational epitope. So a conformational epitope is more flexible because it has folding of one or more genes. So you can have a folding here and then you can have another folding here. Okay, so it allows amino acid from different segments to come into close proximity. So that's another one, okay? So we call it the conformational epitope. Okay, so a while ago, I was telling you that if the antigen is less than less than um, 10,000 in Daltons, we do not call it an antigen, but we simply call it a HAP10. And a HAP10, in order to elicit an immune response, would need a carrier. So a combination of HAP10 and carrier molecule is called a HAP10 carrier conjugate. Okay, so we call it the HAP10 carrier conjugate. Therefore, when you say HAP10, um, it is a non-immunogenic material that create new antigenic determinants, particularly when we combine it with a carrier. 
So it needs to be combined with a carrier. So it can react with antibody even without being complex to a carrier molecule. Okay, so when bound to carriers, it can contribute to the development of interconnected lattice that serves as a basis for precipitation and agglutination reaction. So therefore, in order for us to see precipitation and agglutination reaction, we need carrier. Okay? Carrier. And the most common carrier that we are using in the laboratory are mostly latex particles. Some can use charcoal. Some are even using RPCs, our superior. Okay? So, when you say lattice formation, this is a lattice formation. Okay? A lattice formation. So, if this is an antigen and then there are corresponding antibodies, so that's what you call lattice formation. And lattice formation will allow you to see precipitation and agglutination reaction in vitro. And that would only be made possible if carrier is present. Okay, remember, HAP10 can bind with an antibody, but HAP10 alone cannot result to lattice formation. And a lattice formation is actually the basis for precipitation and agglutination reaction. And that is also the reason why we can see the precipitation and agglutination reaction in vitro. So, to summarize what we have discussed, an epitope is the part of the antigen that binds with the antibody binding site. So the other term that we're using for epitope is paratope. Okay? HAP10 is a small molecules, particularly less than 10,000 in Daltons, which can bind with the antibody binding site. However, HAP10 is not immunogenic unless attached to a larger molecular backbone such as carriers. Okay, a while ago I was telling you about tolerogen. Okay, so excessive large amount of antigen can result to tolerogen. So what is a tolerogen? So tolerogen is actually an antigen that can tolerate, uh, an, that can be tolerated by the immune system. How does it happen? When a potential antigenic molecule is encountered early in the development of specific B cells and T cells. And that particular B cells and T cells that have encountered tolerogen die, prematurely die, an immune response will not occur the next time this molecule is seen. Because this particular molecule is considered to be a self already. Hence, they are called tolerogen. Meaning to say, our immune system is able to tolerate its presence. Okay? So, tolerogen, therefore, will not exhibit anymore, will not elicit anymore an immune response. Because, because um, they were encountered at the time, early at the early development of B or T cells. And that particular B and T cells didn't even then even fully develop because they die prematurely. So the next time around that the same molecules are encountered, then they can easily be tolerated. Okay, so that's what we meant by tolerogen. Okay, another, another um, trait of an immunogen is foreignness. What number are we? I think we're number eight, foreignness. Okay, when you say foreignness, um, the more taxonom taxonomically different, the more successful it is as an immunogen. So that's why bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microorganisms are a very good immunogen because we are not taxonomically related from one another. You are not a prokaryote, right? 
So, you are not taxonomically related to bacteria, for example. That's why bacteria will make a very good reagent. So, in general, the immune response is greater the more different an antigen is from self. Okay? So, for example, this is, um, this is my cell. I have my own genetic makeup. I have my own characteristic. And if a different molecules enter my body, for example, a different kidney will be transplanted, then there's a chance that I will consider that kidney as an antigen. Or, for example, a blood of different blood type is transfused to me. I will be considered that as a foreign molecule, and therefore, that should be considered as an antigen. So, naturally, a person will not normally respond to his or her own antigen. Okay? We will not respond to our own tissue unless uh, you have developed an autoimmune disease. Okay? Or for those of you who have twins, you are lucky because you have the same genetic makeup and, and if the same organ is transplanted to you, more or less, you will not be rejecting that. Okay? But we will react to proteins coming from different person, plants, or microorganisms. Therefore, we cannot just transplant kidneys from one person to another. We cannot just transfuse blood from one person to another. Okay. The antigen of our own tissue results in graft rejection. Okay. Because we have the so-called major histocompatibility complex antigens, which we will be discussing later on. So some molecules of microorganisms are similar to human tissue antigen so that an immune response to the microorganisms can cause immune injury to the host. Let's say, for example, group A streptococcus pyogenes um, um, can mimic, for example, our tissue and, and, in, and as a result of uh, infection, our own immune system may even be destroying our own kidneys, for example, or our own heart, for example. So that is foreignness. Okay? So to give you an idea of the different kinds of graph, these are the different kinds of graph, no? Types of graph. If the graph happens within yourself, Okay, that's what you call autologous. Okay? Autologous, or sometimes we call it an autograft. Okay? So, most common scenario of an autograft happens when um, a, a certain patient got burned and then they harvest tissues from different sites to the burn sites. Okay? So, that's an example of an autograft. Um... The other one is the syngenic graph, or sometimes it's, it's called isograph. This happens among twins, okay? Among twins. And the most successful type of graph is an autograph, and then followed by the isograph, or the syngenic graph, because twins would have the same genetic makeup. Unfortunately, not everyone has a twin, right? So that's the reason why the most common type of graph is an allograph. Okay? Allograph, I think it is sometimes known as homograph. So an allograph or a homograph is the intra species. Meaning to say it happens between the same species. Okay, it happens between the same species. And it's actually quite challenging because even if you are within the same species, you will have a different major histocompatibility complex and you would have to find donors that would have somehow similar genetic makeup from yours. And it's not always 100%. Some would even have 80% compatibility. Some would even have 90% compatibility. So when you say 90% compatibility, there's a still... 10% chance that we do not show the same proteins. And if that happens, there's a chance that the graft or the organs will be rejected. So that's the reason why 
majority of those transplant patients who still need to drink immunosuppressive drugs. So for those who have just received kidney transplant, they would be drinking an immunosuppressive drugs. If, and, and if they're drinking immunosuppressive drugs, that makes them more immunocompromised. You know, there are several factors to consider. Okay, so that is the allograft for you. And then the fourth type of graft is called synogenic or some, sorry, sometimes known as the xenograft. So the xenograft is the interspecies graft. Okay, so in previous years, there has been no reported successful xenograft yet. In fact, kapag sinabihan kayong manghihiram ka ng muka sa aso, the reply is, excuse me, but there has been no successful recorded sinograph yet until last week. Imagine just last week, kaya fresh na fresh yung lecture natin. Is it the first successful sinograph? Well, Nature has published last January 14, 2022, the first case of a successful pig to human heart transplant. So there was a case of a successful pig to human heart transplant. Okay? So researchers hope that a person who has far deep for a week, so isang linggo pa lang nabubuhay yung tao, with a genetically, genetically modified pig heart will provide a trove of data on the possibility of Sino transplantation. So surgeons at the University of Maryland Medical Center transplanted a genetically altered pig heart into David Bennett. So David Bennett was the patient who received pig heart. Okay? So imagine... No? So this will totally change the way our textbook has been uh, has been discussing about sinograph. Because if you will be reading about textbook, they say that there has been no successful sinograph yet. But we cannot say that it is already successful because the operation is fresh. Still, still, uh, we would still be waiting. We would still be waiting for that person, for David Bennett. If David Bennett will survive more than five years or so, then we can say that probably Sinograph is successful. Okay, so therefore, let's talk about the relationships of antigen to the host. Okay, so though a while ago I was telling you that I was telling you that um, we do not we do not um, produce or we do not react to our own tissue. Because an autoantigen, the term auto refers to cells. Okay? So the term auto refers to cells, meaning to say it belongs to the host. And we do not, do not, and an autoantigen will not usually evoke an immune response to the host. Okay? If, in, if, if, there's a possibility that immune response occur, an autoimmune condition is likely. Meaning to say, um, you have already developed an autoimmune disease. Okay? An alloantigen is coming from other members of host species, such as, for example, a kidney transplant or blood from, from donors kidney transplant or blood from other donors. And your donors must be humans. Okay, so that's what you call alloantigen. Heteroantigen are from other species such as animal, plants, or microorganisms. So this is the xenograph. So xenograph would involve um, heteroantigen. Okay? But in cases of David Bennett, the one that he received was a genetically modified uh, pig's heart. So somehow, um, the genetic makeups uh, are actually 
would actually match the genetic makeup of David Bennett. I don't know. So that must have been very expensive, right? And then heterophyll antigen, I'm sorry for that. Heterophyll antigen exists in plants or animals, but are identical to or closely related in structure so that antibody to one will cross your up with antigen of the others. Okay? So example, um, if you are a type B individual, okay, and then you get infected with streptococcus pneumonia, um, that is kind of uh, intriguing because the pneumococcal antigen will cross-react with type blood group B antigen. So when your immune system produces antibody against pneumococci, that particular antibodies may even, you know, somehow affect the RBC of that particular patient because the antigen and the type B blood have similar um, or closely related structure. So the pneumococcal antigen, therefore, is considered to be as the heterophyll antigen. Okay, I hope that's clear. Okay, so... I forget what number are we. Uh, foreignness is number eight. Okay, and the last one is genetic capacity or genetic predisposition. So this is where we will be discussing um, the major histocompatibility complex. So the ninth factor that can influence the immune response is called um, genetic capacity or genetic predisposition. Okay. Let's talk about the major histocompatibility complex. Um, we are humans and we are made up of tissues. Okay. Our tissues have molecules on the plasma membrane. So, for example, um, these are my kidneys. And if you will be getting the cells of my kidneys, okay, at the plasma membrane of my cells, I have molecules. And we call it the MHC molecules. Okay. So, the MHC molecules are actually made up of surface proteins. Okay? And these surface proteins are actually called HLA. Okay? So, this HLA is known as the human leukocyte antigens. And why HLA is important? They are important in antigen presentation, and the regulation of the immune response. And do you know that each one of us, each one of us, okay, has different set of HLA antigens. Okay, so each one of us would have a different set of HLA antigens. And these are in haplotypes. I mean to say, we inherit the other half from our mother, and then we inherit the other half from our father. Okay? So, remember that there are two types of MHC. Okay? There are two types of MHC. Okay? We have the MHC class 1. Actually, there are three. MHC class 2. But for today, uh, we will just be concentrating on two classes. Okay? MHC class 1 and MHC class 2. So, MHC class 1 are mostly found in eukaryotic cells. So, meaning to say, sorry, somatic cells. All cells of our body would have the MHC class 1 except for the antigen-presenting cells because they have the MHC class 2. 
okay so why they are important why do you think they are important why do you think they are important because they are linked to the genetic capa capability that allows the body to mount an immune response this explains the reason why before you get kidneys from other donor you should have tissue typing to determine whether that particular kidneys can be transplanted to you or not. Okay? They have been found on all nucleated cells in the body. Okay? So, katulad nga ng sinabi ko, uh, MHC class 1 and then MHC class 2. They play a pivotal role in the development of humoral and cellular immunity. By the way, um, just to give you an idea, um, humoral immunity is the primary role of B cells and cellular immunity is the primary role of B cells. Okay. So the major histocompatibility complex is important primarily in transplantation of tissues. So this will determine whether the tissue is compatible to the uh, to the recipient, whether the donor will be accepted, or whether that particular tissue will be recognized as foreign. If that tissue is recognized as foreign, then it will be rejected. However, let me tell you this fact: if we do not have twins, we do not have twins. You will not have. 100% histocompatible tissues. So usually, they will look for donors who are blood-related to you, most especially your siblings. However, not all your siblings will be, would have the same MHC makeup as you are. Not all siblings would have the same MHC makeup as you are. So that's the reason why... Um, uh, that's the reason why sometimes they are looking for the random donor, hoping that that particular random donor would have the same histocompatibility or very high histocompatibility. So it brings antigen in the body to the surface of cells for recognition by T cells. Okay, so when combined with antigen on the surface of other cells, it will now activate T cells. Okay, so there are two types of T cells that can be activated, okay? So it can activate the T helper cell or the CD4. And it can even activate the cytotoxic T cell or the CD. Okay, so the MHC molecules can activate, can activate two types of T cells, either the CD4, and the other one is the CD8. Okay, so we have 46 chromosomes. And out of the six, out of the 46 chromosomes, okay, each chromosome would have a short arm and the long arm. Okay, now out of the 46 chromosomes, the the molecules of the MHC, pro the, the proteins of the MHC molecules are being encoded in chromosomes number six, specifically at its short arm. Okay, at the short arm of chromosomes number six. And it is divided into three categories. Okay, so however, for today's meeting, we will only be concentrating on the two classes. Because class 3 molecules are actually complement uh, proteins and we will be discussing it on another chapter. So for today, we will just be concentrating on two classes of MHC molecules. We have the class 1 and the class 2. So class 1 is designated as HLA A, HLA B and HLA C. Class 2 is designated as HLA DR, HLA DP, 
and HLA PQ A. So let's talk about classes one and two. Bakit class one and two lang tayo? Because they are the one that is involved in antigen recognition. Unlike class three. Class 3 is involved in complement casting. So take note, ha? Class 3 is involved in complement casting, and we will not be discussing complement yet for today. For today, we will just be discussing um, classes 1 and 2, which is about the antigen recognition. So they can influence the antigens to which T cells respond. Okay? So again, there are three types, or uh, two types of T cells for this particular discussion, the CD4 and the CD8. Class 3, as what I've told you, is composed of secreted proteins that have an immune function, but they are not expressed on cell surfaces. So they are involved in complement testing. Okay. So, ito na yon. What's the difference between the class 1 and class 2? Class 1 is present on all nucleated cells, meaning to say all cells on our body, okay, we can find class 1. Class 2 is present in antigen presenting cells. Okay, so class 1, so so to give you the difference, no? Class 1, class 2. Class 1 is found in all nucleated cells. So, examples of nucleated cells. Um, the kidney cells, liver cells, uh, practically all cells of our body. Okay, class 2, class 2, um, is found in antigen presenting cells. So, most common examples are macrophages, okay, dendritic cells, okay, and then class one is seen by CD8. Okay, class two is seen by CD4. And our designation for class 1 is HLA, A, D, and C. And our designation for class 2 is HLA, D, P, D, Q, and D, R. These are our designations for HLA class 2. Okay, so these are the differences between the class 1 and class 2. Hindi lang yan, there are other differences. Okay, we will be discussing that later on. Alleles are alternate forms of a genes that codes for a slightly different variety of the same product. Okay, so HLA-A has over 2,000 different alleles. Imagine, no? Kung mag, if you will be getting for a random donor what are the possibility that among the different class a individuals 2000 would be the same match but you will not just be considering a yeah. there are still others like for example b has 2600 different alleles and c has over 1500 different alleles so imagine it's really quite challenging to find an exact match an exact match of actually a class one coming from a random donor so it's actually very important that you're friends with your siblings okay or or it's very important that uh, you have twins but most important thing of all is take care of your kidneys okay if you will not be taking care of your kidneys and if you will just be uh, if you'll just be relying on kidney transplant, then the chance of graft rejection is very high. 
Okay, so, so this is chromosomes number six, particularly the short arm of chromosomes number six. Okay, so the short arm of chromosomes number six would have different genome or the region. So the DP region is here. This is the DQ region, then these are the DR region, then this is the region A, B, and C. So this is for the class one, then this is for the class two, and then this is the class three. So the short arm of chromosome number six that encodes what type of alleles you'll have. And it's a haplotype. Haplotype, meaning to say, this particular arm comes from your father. Then there's another arm that should come from your mother. Because the MC genes are closely linked and inheritance for grouping, so that is actually known as haplotype. So one haplotype is inherited from each parent. So that's why I'm telling you, this is just one haplotype. Then there should be another arm coming from the other haplotype. So, for, so which means that these particular alleles are codominant because they are being expressed. And the total set of alleles on each chromosome is called haplotype. So, for example, this is the um, this is the haplotype coming from your mother. This is the haplotype coming from your father. So, your mother gave you A1, B2, and C3. Imagine that it can be up to A1000 because there are more than 1000 alleles for type A, diba? So, so this comes from your mother and then this comes from your father. However, if your haplotypes, haplotypes are the ones that are phenotypically expressed. Okay, and then this is your genotype. Your genotype is just A1, B2, B4, C2, C3. Bakit lima na lang to? One, two, three, four, five. Eh, eto. This is six. One. Two, three, four, five, and six. Bakit ganon? Because A1 is a common haplotype. A1 is a common haplotype coming from the mother, and we have another A1 here. So that's why the genotype is just A1. We do not repeat A1, A1. I hope that's clear. However, let's say, for example, if the haplotype of the parents of the father is you get A2, B3 and C4 from the mother, and then you get A5, B4, and C6 from the father, then your gene type would be A2, A5, B3, B4, and then C4, and C6. Okay? So, that's, that's the... Um, that's how we express it. Okay, that's the genotype. Okay, so why is it important? The, so again, it's important for tissue transplantation. So transplantation compatibility. So I'd like to give an exercise. So for example, the recipient Genotype is and then this is the donor one and then this is the donor two. And this is the the donor one has this kind of
um, how do we determine if you have two donors? You have two donors, and this is your this is your genotype, and then this is the genotype of donor one and donor two. Which one would have the greater match? So what do we do? So A2 is a match, A7 is not, B3 is a match, B6 is not, C4 is a match. So here you get four out of six. A dollar two, A1 is a match, A8 is not, B5 is a match, B2, uh, B5 is not a match. B2 is not a match, C9 is a match, C8 is not a match. So here you get 2 out of 6. So obviously, if this is the case, we will be choosing donor 1 over donor number 2. But donor number 1 is not 100% match, right? Donor one is not hundred percent match, so that's the reason why, um, in the course of that particular transplant, donor one would still be drinking immunosuppressive drugs. The most common types of immunosuppressive drug is cyclosporine, and what's the advantage? Cyclosporine will prevent graft rejection. What's the disadvantage? It will make the recipient immunocompromised. So you have to choose rejection or immunocompromised. Majority of the doctor would would uh, would actually um, would actually uh, say that you have to drink um, immunosuppressive drugs and just take care of your immune system. I'm meaning to say, uh, you do not just go anywhere else. But you know, nowadays that's a problem, particularly amidst the pandemic. But then, you cannot really choose it. You really need those kidneys. Otherwise, you'll be in dialysis three times a week, diba? So yeah, yon. So immunosuppressive drugs. Okay, I have a friend. Um, she got kidneys from her sister but not 100%. So, um, because she finally uh, agreed to have transplantation because she's tired of dialysis. Okay? So, what happened is that she still died. You know what? You know why? She died from Pseudomonas aeruginosa pneumonia. Okay? So, so during that time, after she received her kidneys, she drank um, cyclos uh, immunosuppressive drugs. So that weakens her immune system, and in doing so, and in doing so, um, doing so, uh, she did not die from graft rejection, but she died from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Imagine, no. So after all the efforts, then you. So it's really a very complicated matter. So as early as now, tell your loved ones. To take care of your kidneys. Okay. Huh. Okay, so let's talk about the class one MHC molecules. So as what I've told you. Um, class 1 MC molecules are expressed on all nucleated cells. And they are differ in level of expression, meaning to say MHC molecules have highest expression on lymphocytes and myeloid cells. So myeloid cells are cells of the bone marrow. But they are lowest or undetectable in liver hepatocytes neural cells, muscle cells, and spermatozoa. That's the reason why there are more successful liver transplant than that of the kidney transplant because they are almost undetectable in liver hepatocytes. So this is how the MHC class 1 look like. So for example, this is the cell membrane. 
this is the nucleus. And here, you can find the MHC class 1. Okay? So, the MHC class 1 is a single chain here. It's a single chain and anchored in the cell membrane stabilized by beta 2 microglobulin. So, this is the beta 2 microglobulin, but it is a single chain. Okay? The MHC class 1 has a group. Okay, this is the group of MHC class 1. And it holds antigen peptides for presentation to cytotoxic cells. So fragments, these are antigen fragments. These are antigen fragments. So antigen fragments are displayed in the group. And this will be presented to CD8. CD8 or the cytotoxic T cells. So where can we find MHC class 1? This is the cell membrane of the all nucleated cells of our body. Okay, so these are the cell membrane of all the nucleated cells of our body. So the glycoprotein dimer made up, the, made up of two non-covalently linked polypeptides. Okay, so this is the beta microglobulin this is the group or the class okay and so cd8 binds here cd8 binds here so cd8 binds at the membrane proximal domains because um eight that's the a3 a2 is the membrane distal domains and A1 is where the peptide binding cleft is located, alpha 1. Okay, so class, twos, uh, class 2 are, is, class 2 molecules are primarily found on antigen-presenting cells. So antigen-presenting cells include the following. So we have the B lymphocytes, the monocytes, the macrophages, the dendritic cells, and the thymic epithelium. So again, they're made up of two chains. So again, that's another difference. Huh? Class one is single chain, but they are they have beta two microglobulin. Class two is a double chain, but class two doesn't have the beta two microglobulin, and they also have a group. And this is where the antigen fragments uh, will be, and the group. And the antigen will be presented to CD4. Okay, CD4 is also known as the T helper cells. So the group of class two molecules are larger than the group of the MHC class one. Okay, so they are much larger than the MHC class one. So MHC class two molecules, these are HLA, DP, DQ, and DR. So there are two non covalently bound polypeptides that are encoded by separate genes in the MHC complex. Okay, so MHC class 1 process, um, process endogenous tissue and the peptides are approximately 8 to 11 amino acids in length. And there are actually two transporters associated with antigen processing. These two transporters are the top one and the top two. Okay, so they will transport antigenic peptides to the endoplasmic reticulum where they bind to MHC class one molecules. MHC class two participates in exogenous pathway of antigen presentation. So again, class one is an endogenous pathway, class two is an exogenous pathway. So just like your MHC class one, Molecules are also being synthesized in endoplasmic reticulum. You might find it um, much complex now, but later on I will present to you an animation so that um, you'll be able to understand it. So it is cleaved to form a fragment called clip, which is exchanged for the antigenic peptide, and the MHC peptide complex is transported to the cell surface. Um, why is it important? Why they are significant? Number one is for tissue transplantation. Okay, 
class 1 and class 2, both of them can induce graph rejection. They also appear to play a role in the development of an autoimmune disease. So, for example, if you have B27 allele, most likely you might develop an autoimmune disease called ankylosing spondylitis if it's characterized by inflammation of the vertebrae of the spine. And they, very, they have a very strong association. And if you have DQ2 and DQ8, you might develop celiac disease. An autoimmune disease characterized by diarrhea, weight loss, and even intolerance to gluten. But between the two, it is the DQ2 that would have higher strength of association as compared to DQ8. If you have DR4, you might develop rheumatoid arthritis characterized by inflammation of multiple joints. But the strength of association is actually uh, not, that, not really strong. So just, there's just a clear association. If you have DQ8 and DQ2 allele, you might develop type 1 diabetes characterized by increasing blood glucose because of the destruction of insulin producing cells, particularly at the beta cells at the island of the Langenhorns of the pancreas. So DQ8 has a strong association as compared to DQ2. Okay, so they are important not just in graph rejection, they are also important in the development or association or predisposition to autoimmune diseases. And the third clinical significance is for paternity testing. So, although nowadays DNA testing is actually more, more sensitive and specific, but MHC somehow can also determine paternity testing because of the fact that haplotypes are, these haplotypes are being inherited by both parents, to, from, from both parents. That's another clinical significance of um, major histocompatibility. Um, HLA typing. HLA typing can be determined through transplantation. Okay, important in transplantation, and they can be determined using serological tests. Okay, meaning to say we use antibodies against different HLA antigen to determine the donor and recipient types. We can also culture them and look for mixed lymphocytes reactions, particularly for HLA-B. And actually, there's a third method by means of flow cytometry. So we can also determine um, the, the, the types of MHC molecules that you have by means of flow cytometry. Okay, so I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>